Hey, welcome, welcome everybody. Thank you for those of us joining us, whether you're joining us live or in the recording, this promises to be a great, insightful and revealing conversation on the topic of money, economics. This is something that literally rules our every day. And yet what I find is that most people have a very little understanding and awareness of money and economics. And uh, it certainly could not be called holistic. So we want to shift that. That has been one of my goals and missions in life. And I kind of accidentally found myself down this path as a business owner, having to, you know, face things like accounting. And uh, as I've gone down that path, just realizing how empowering it is to have financial literacy, and to be able to understand what what money is what it is truly. And, uh, you know, some, some of the ideas that I've come across and embody, I have seen reflected in our special guest today, Mark Inielski. He is an economist and a, what is your title? Again, it's a uh, uh, economic strategist. He specializes in measuring the well-being and happiness of nations, communities, and businesses. He holds three degrees uh, in, from the University of Alberta, economics, forest science, and masters of forest science and economics. And uh, he's the author of two books, correct? Just two or, or more than that? Two books. And, you know, there's always more. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> It's just the time in terms of writing and creating them, isn't it? So that's right. Yeah. So uh, author of an economy of well-being and the economics of happiness, and just yeah. to kind of provide a little bit of an insight. Oh, there they are. Wonderful. Right, Genuine wealth and happiness. That's right. Um, yeah. Economics of happiness. He explains how economics, accounting, capitalism, and banking, which dominate our consciousness, can be re reoriented towards the pursuit of genuine happiness. Uh, how to rediscover the original meaning of the language economics. And this, that's a very fascinating topic for me because I know as I got into it, I was trying to understand it. It's almost like it's intentionally shrouded in, you know, complex language. And, you know, why didn't we learn this in school? I, I often make the analogy that, uh, you know, if you were to say somebody's illiterate in today's society, that would be pretty shocking. But I would say that most people, 90% plus, are actually financially illiterate. Um, how to measure genuine wealth, which consists of five capital assets, human, social, natural, built, and financial. He talks about how nations, governments, and communities, and businesses are using the genuine wealth model to help build the new economy of well-being. And uh, no more relevant a conversation now, and I think to come as we begin to experience the, the ramifications of, of what's been happening and how that's going to affect our economy. So welcome, Mark. Thank you for being on the call and, and sharing your wisdom with us. Thanks, Malcolm. Thanks for having me. Cool. Well, I wanted to start off. I know this is, this is probably going to be a very big, broad question, but interpret it and share in, in whatever way your heart feels fit is what is it you would like to have listeners understand about money and the economy just right off the bat to kind of set the foundation for our conversation? Well, money is uh, an amazing invention. We've, um, I mean, we've been using money for a a long time since we started with uh, seashells back in the ancient Polynesian culture, which uh, gave rise to the Chinese uh, invention of money, the coinage. And so money is, and, and even the word, some of the words associated with money, like cattle, um, cattle was a form of money. So money is, is a form of, uh, of an exchange medium, if you like. Uh, but today money has been dominated mostly by debt-based money. So money that's created uh, as debt, uh, one banks issue loans. And most people don't understand that that's actually the majority of our money supply, about 98% of our money supply now that exists was created as a bank loan uh, or governments selling bonds into the markets. So selling debt, these are all debt instruments, but they have actually have nothing to do really with real assets like soil or even well being. So it's an interesting uh, situation we're in where, um, yeah, as you said, people are mostly ignorant about where money comes from. If you, if I walked on the street um, in Calgary right now, uh, you know, I'm not sure how many people I'd meet that I would ask, what is money? And they would fumble. Even I remember a film that interviewed Paul Martin when he was finance minister and even Paul Martin stumbled, fumbled with his coffee cup and said, well, actually in the beginning, and you could tell he didn't really know what money was either. So um, this is kind of a, a very strange indictment of 
economists and, and our leaders who actually have no idea where money comes from, uh, who creates it, and, and why we are so obsessed with money when we, uh, we know so little about it. Right, yeah. So do you, do you create that distinction between, you know, what is money and what is currency? Uh, well, currency is, you know, currency by in terms of, you know, the, the paper money or plastic money that we call money is a, a very small portion, about 2% of the total money supply is only paper currency. So, and that that is created by the central bank or by the mint. Uh, and that is actually created basically free of charge as a public utility. But the 98% of the money we call money, the money that's actually created as in the form of a loan, a mortgage, a student loan, uh, even holding a credit card balance, you're creating uh, new money by um, through these debt instruments. So that is not currency, that is debt created money. Right, and it, it, am I interpreting this correct? So you're, you're saying, and my understanding as well, is that money is loaned into existence. Is there ever a way of getting out of debt or will we always as, as a society be in debt because as soon as we take out a loan, we owe that exact same amount of money back plus interest? That's right. So. I mean, it, it gives you a headache when you think about all the complex uh, complexities of everyone, you know, going for a mortgage or so we're all in a sense creating money every time we, we ask for a loan. Uh, so in a sense, we create this game of musical chairs. Now the problem is that the, the money re required to pay the interest on the debt doesn't exist. It doesn't pre-exist. So that's like playing musical chairs where it's as if someone always when the needle goes off the record player, someone's always going bankrupt. I know it sounds bizarre in a way, but this is actually how it works. So the, um, the problem is if you actually, and this is the aha moment for me, I thought, well, okay, if I pay off my mortgage, that's great. I basically extinguish debt money by paying off the mortgage. And you think, oh, that's great, good, good for me. But somebody else is always going to get the next mortgage. And so what happens to the total amount of debt that's being created in society. And when I looked at the stats, I was shocked to see that the amount of debt since World War II, both in almost every country, especially the US and Canada, has been growing exponentially. Yeah. In other words, it's compounding and building on top of a big, you know, just a larger pile of debt outstanding. That would suggest that the debt collectively as a whole society is not being repaid. Uh, and probably can't ever be repaid. And, and that's where we sort of find ourselves in a trap. So that means that a larger portion of our expenditures in the economy are actually the interest payments on all that debt, which is a shockingly big number, something like 75% of the average American household today is, is spending 75% of their expenditures. It's going to hidden interest charges on wow. the total amount of debt. And the debt yeah. is now exploded with COVID. So we've got about 80, over 80 trillion in the US and about, uh, about one tenth of that in Canada that's outstanding, that has to be paid back uh, basically, but can't be ultimately. So it's, it's a, we're in a kind of a dead end street. Right. And uh, from my understanding, there's, there's kind of two paths you can take is you can either come to this debt forgiveness, this debt jubilee, okay, we're just going to wipe it out, or uh, you print it away, basically debase the currency. I'm not sure. Does, does that even work? Because you're, again, you're just creating more money to pay back this debt. Well, my argument is that this whole, and this is a global system. So it's not like one country, Canada can't just, you know, we could extinguish and forgive all the debt. But then people say, well, then that would create a, uh, a run on the Canadian dollar, right? The dollar would be devalued. So it would almost have to be a, a global, uh, you know, debt forgiveness, what the Jews call the Jubilee and the Assyrian or the Sumerian cultures called a, uh, um, it wasn't called a Jubilee, what was it called? I can't even remember now what it was called, clean slate. It was right. a clean slate law. So, and, and the Sumerian culture, they were, I guess, I guess they were good at math. They realized that that debts should be forgiven every seven years. Okay. Right. Because it, it took that long for a farmer, if a farmer ever got in debt, which a farmer would never probably have to get in debt. Uh, they could actually pay off that debt in three years of like just, you know, productivity of the, of their crops. But um, 
so that was interesting that this ancient Sumerians had these kind of uh, clean slate laws. The Jews adopted them after their exile in Babylon, uh, but no one ever really practiced them. I don't think they've ever been, they haven't been practiced since the ancient Sumerian times. The Romans never practiced it. So we have this 2000 plus years, right, of the same system uh, in which, and today we're stuck with a similar situation um, where debt is so large and it's been actually growing at about seven to eight years, seven, seven to eight years it doubles right? so since World War II. Um, now you could, in theory, just wipe it all out and we'll say, let's start again. But if we're going to start again, what are we going to start with? We're going to start with something fancier like blockchain, you know, Bitcoin, Ethereum, you know, all these fancy new forms of money? Or would we want a system in which actually we're each other's banker? So we create money, say, as Albertans for, for our needs, for the people of Alberta. And I've argued we can do that. We could do that through the public banking structure we have. We have Alberta Treasury Branch and the Bank of Canada could play the same role nationally. So that means money then could become a public utility. That would change everything. Imagine if you woke up and it was like water in your tap and you just got you know, this much money in your cup for the day. But by the end of the day, it was empty and you couldn't put it away or hoard it or store it. It would just be done, but it'd be enough, right? And uh, you would work, you would still work. You would still do what you're supposed, you know, what you're good at doing. Um, but you would have this kind of notion of a living wage. And that's actually quite possible right now during this uh, pandemic um, and, and globally applicable. Now, will, will they, they being the, the banking and money authority, allow that to happen? Or will something else happen? That's the only question right now. Yeah, and, and let's, let's dig into that a little bit further. I really want to go into, you know, what are solutions moving forward, but I think to kind of understand the, the predicament, the problem that we're in, you know, right now. Uh, so my understanding, so the question is, is twofold, is that when you borrow money from a bank, you know, like to, to get your mortgage, this kind of a thing, they actually don't have that money at all. Like when you're- That's correct creating a, you know, credit card payment, this kind of a thing. It's you create it literally out of thin air. And I don't know how the banks and the credit card companies got this type of deal, but oh my gosh, <laughs> they can just create the credit out of nowhere and then have the privilege of charging you interest for you creating that money out of thin air. So what an advantageous position to be in. And so that's how it works kind of on a, on a personal and a public level. And is it not similar on a government level? Like who are we in debt to? When you hear that every single country is in debt, who, 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 are, all, who are all these countries in debt to? Well, it, this is, that, that's another fundamental. So there's, it's not bad enough that we're basically enslaving each other when we go and get the mortgage or, the, or keep a credit card balance, but we're also having governments sell their debt. So to, to who? So what, what does government debt look like? It looks like it's called bonds, right? So we, they sell bonds and they say, well, we sell it to the market. It's like, well, who's the market? Well, the market is everybody, you know, some anonymous, you know, little piece of the Alberta debt bond is owned by the Ontario, Ontario Teachers Pension Plan or the Canadian Pension Plan, or maybe it's in our own, uh, you know, AIMCO funds, but that's an interesting question. So wait, let, let me get this right. So as governments, you can issue money um, out of your central bank for nothing. For, or you could, buy, you could buy the federal government debt bonds when they have to deficit finance. Most governments before 73 did not, did not have to run deficits. Um, and therefore they issued or sold very little debt. And if the debt was sold prior to 73, it was probably purchased by the bank Canada, which is our bank. So that's the interesting thing I've been writing about is like, so under COVID, when we just issued $400 billion uh, in new debt money to pay for COVID, who bought the bonds? Who bought the debt? How much is held by the private markets? How much did the Bank of Canada purchase? And what about all the provincial debt that were just issued? So these kind of conversations are not making CBC news or our standard news outlets. Yeah. And, it's, and true. Uh, it's, it's a big question. It's a very important question. 
Um, and it's, uh, again, it's this question of what role can do governments play in uh, issuing debt themselves? Um, and as, as I said, the interest, if you look at what happened after 74, you know, when the, when Canada decided that they would sell government debt to the private markets, you see governments starting to run very large deficits and then the debt starts to build and build. Right. And uh, for those of you who don't know, if, if you don't know the history, that was uh, Trudeau, Pierre Trudeau, uh, Justin's father, that uh, that made that decision and initiated and took us down that path. So, yeah, as did a lot of other countries. Trudeau wasn't, you know, Canada was not alone. Um, and the U.S. has been down, the U.S. has been in worse shape uh, since the death of Abraham Lincoln. So, but Canada always had a sovereign central bank. So that's the important piece of Canada is why did we decide that relinquishing that money creation power to the private sector was a good thing. Right. Yeah. So who has the political will to, to shift that back? Right. That's right. That's a big question. And yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. So you mentioned a little bit about uh, kind of moving forward in that sense. Um, so this idea of a living wage and, and is that kind of in, in the realm of, you know, universal basic income, that kind of a thing. And, and how would that be different if, uh, if it was public, if we, you know, utilized the bank of Canada, you know, as, as a publicly funded organization versus, and as you suggest that ATB is as well. Well, I think obviously it would change, change life uh, significantly. I think there'd be a lot less anxiety and I, you know, I'm, I'm of two minds of, of a living wage. I don't think it's a recipe. It shouldn't be considered simply a, a free kind of paycheck that you don't do anything with your life. You just sit around. And uh, I, I think, I think the transition to an economy in which money was a public utility uh, would be, would have to be a transition because I'm not sure we'd know what to do with ourselves. If suddenly you just had two grand in your bank account every month as, as we did during COVID uh, in the early days. But, but I think there has, I think the, the opportunity to create money in parallel with our needs and our well being is possible. Uh, and that might require more elaborate system in determining, well, how much money, like is 20 bucks an hour, uh, you know, is that a living wage? Is that sufficient to have people have a reasonably good basket of needs met? Um, and, that doesn't squelch entrepreneurship, doesn't mean that you can't make 60 bucks an hour or hundred dollars an hour, uh, but it would solve a lot of the, the, the low income problems that, that uh, we face in the country. The poverty issues would pretty much go away. And there's different ways of doing that too. You could use the tax policy levers that governments have. You could increase the personal exemption on the income tax forms so that the 20 bucks an hour could just be part of the threshold that you've just achieved by increasing that that minimum uh, basic um, cutoff. So there's different ways of doing this, I think. It's but it would raise an interesting debate in this country as to what if we suddenly are each other's bankers and we have to sit around decide as if we're the monetary authority. How much how much current liquidity do we need for Alberta? What kind of economy do we want? Uh, where is there underemployment of resources? You know, do we want more permaculture? You know, all kinds of things. We, we could have all kinds of interesting conversations about what kind of economy we want and then decide how much liquidity we need to, you know, provide that oxygen for that economy to, uh, to thrive. Yeah, you're absolutely right that things, things would have to shift a lot. I, I, I can imagine a lot of people listening like, well, how do I even be a part of that conversation? Well, we need yeah. to understand you know, where we're at and, and move forward, increase our financial literacy just as much as I hope. Uh, and I have seen a shift in people's attitude and approach to health, taking more self-responsibility. And I think we're in the position we're in where we've just, we've just outsourced it, right? Oh, someone else is taking care of it. And uh, so if, if there were ever a silver lining, if there were ever a message, I, I feel through this time is, is for individuals to take more 
self-responsibility and to educate themselves and, and a more active engagement in these conversations, the political process, the economic process. Uh, and yeah, I think that's ultimately where we need to go. And well, that's right. it, Malcolm. It's, it's about education. It's about awareness. I mean, I didn't learn any of this in high school or university things I'm t- talking about. I had to learn them, you know, off this corner of my desk and, uh, and some, you know, I always warn my business students when you, when the lights do go on, you realize, oh my goodness, like, wouldn't it be nice just to have a banking license, a, a corporate charter? I, I could just create money and be, live happily ever after, right? Yeah. And I'm like, yeah, that's actually, isn't that true? Like, we could all, what if we just all had our own banks? Um, or, or we started credit unions that we start to lend money to each other. And we, you know, it's all legitimate because it already exists. Uh, wouldn't that be cool? Yeah. But, uh, you know, the, the education piece is so, so critical and, and yet we're, we're just not aware. And so we don't even start the conversation based on an awareness of right. how the, how it works now and what's possible. So another parallel I've got between, you know, my world of focusing on health and and your world and focusing on finance and economics is that we absolutely can learn from history. We can learn from past cultures. And like you say, we've had this predominant system for 2000 years, but there has to be like a a ton of gems from how people did this in the past. Are are there kind of some examples uh, that, you know, you've come across in your research? And and I I do, I listen to your podcast. Let's let's give that a shout out first and foremost. (laughs) Thanks. Yeah. Uh, the, let us know the name of your podcast and how folks can find it. The Economy of Wellbeing uh, podcast, wow. 62 uh, interviews so far. So, I mean, these kind of conversations with interesting guests ranging from, you know, health to a uh, macro level, you know, financial policy. So you can find it on all the podcast platforms. Yeah, awesome. It's uh, definitely uh, worth a listen and, and how I've gotten to know Mark and his work. This is our first conversation face to face or Zoom to Zoom, as it were. <laughs> and uh, so, yeah, you've you know, you do you really got a, a broad, you know, holistic perspective. So any gems from cultures in, in your research, again, that you've said uh, diving into this yourself that you're like, wow, that that's fascinating. Like, who knew we could approach money and economics in this way? Well, like I said, that. You know, if you study, there's some economic historians that have studied those ancient cultures of Babylon and Samaria, um, and apparently it's it, it, the Rosetta Stone, that stone that they used to interpret hieroglyphs in Egypt, actually has the uh, clean slate laws written onto that stone, which, if that's true, would be remarkable that we, that, oops, how did we miss that? Uh, so it's not like someone didn't write it down or, you know, scribe it into a stone um so we can go back to those ancient sumerian cultures which understood uh, mathematics and sacred geometry like how did they know it was seven years you know or so i think we we can learn a lot from those ancient cultures and maybe they had uh systems in which laws were maintained by the by the priest culture or the king or the emperor so you know it was like no money will be treated as a public utility right and uh, and so just to study them and understand they had different interest rates for different kind of groups in society too like for those business people who wanted to trade outside of samaria those debts weren't readily forgiven because they, they were taking risks and you could say well actually that that kind of created a, a more um op- optimum condition for local economies. So you'd have, you know, you want your money circulating within the Alberta economy locally as much as possible. So it's more efficient, right? Uh, So looks like Samaria kind of had that figured out. And uh, again, lost to the history, like lost in the dust of history. Now, what about indigenous people of Turtle Island, North America? Well, they used uh, behind me as a bunch bunch of seashells and they the, so the Polynesian people, I said, the ancient Polynesian people were really the originators of money systems, which, so the original people of Polynesia came from Taiwan and the Taiwanese had shell economy. Now the shells were then also used in North America. And some of those shells don't exist on the shores of North America. So they had to would have come from Hawaii, Ataroa, from the Maori, from you know Tahiti, places like that. 
And how were the shells used? Well, supposedly in Edmonton, the shells were used as a form of money for things like obsidian, for making tools, rare things. Uh, mostly economic exchange was done in, in simply oral kind of ex equivalency of trade of equivalencies. But if the, car, if the shells, there were two types of shells, the like dentelia shell, a cowry shell, were in fact forms of money, then what do our own, literally in our own river valley here, that economy was going on for 8,000 years. Wow. Before, before we came from Europe or wherever and thought we would, you know, conquer or whatever we, with our laws, rather right, with our codified laws from Britain, which of course is borrowed from the Romans, we brought those systems here and squelched what, what customs do they have, the potlatch on the West Coast, a kind of a way of over gifting, right? So because of the abundance of what we had as households. So we would hold a potlatch every few years. One family would hold, you know, every year, another family would have a giant feast. Uh, and then we have the wampum, which is the, um, the shells so sewn on buckskin, which were used to represent treaties, right? In the Eastern uh, indigenous cultures, the Iroquois and others. And that actually gave inspiration to George Washington and Benjamin Franklin. I mean, the whole Iroquois Confederacy model based on shells, you know, sewn onto fabric, uh, representing what? It was like, that would like represent their gold, so to speak. What elaborate systems were in place that gave this shell value? You know, don't know. Actually don't know, but just we can maybe have the elders remind us of their memory, their, you know, their foggy memory of the, what happened or what, how things operated in Edmonton and Calgary and those gathering places. Um, but again, I think it's our responsibility to imagine what it was like then and how that ancient culture could find a modern expression here. Yeah. Cool. No, that's beautiful. All right, well, let's let, let's pull it out a bit. Let's <laughs> kind of at uh, a big macro picture and uh, definitely this this kind of shift of, of balance and power. Like for me personally, I believe, and it is not, I don't I know I'm not unique in this that uh, we are witnessing the the decline of an empire. Right, um, the American Empire is is in in decline. Uh, it's quite fascinating uh, to watch and, and, and scary in its reality, but it is what it is what it is. And there's there's kind of this going to be this shift of power. Power. And I remember listening to an interview, you were talking about how that balance of power from east to west does shift. And there's been a lot of talk about China as the new superpower. And I know a lot of uh, perspectives around uh, China are, are, are less than, uh, you know, ideal. And mm -hmm. for sure, they, they do have a lot of human rights issues. But I found your take on it uh, quite refreshing. And I'd uh, love, love you to share that perspective. Well, I, I learned having uh, been an advisor to China uh, for about four years on macroeconomic policy that uh, I was actually just in reading their, you know, the sort of um, tourist books on China that, you know, China had this, of course, 5,000 years of culture. And of course, I've just said they had a, the ancient knowledge of money. They created the first coins, right? And, um, and so... And they, they had this ancient sort of Taiwanese Polynesian, right? Roots as well. So what would they teach us about money? Five, you know, longest sustained civilization, um, you know, and, and until Mao came in, you know, there we, we had a, an empire system. So my reading of Chinese history was that mm -hmm. it was uh, the nationalists under Sun Yat-sen who actually studied Abraham Lincoln's ideas for money. Now, you have to go back to the Civil War, and there's always been this struggle in the U.S. over who controls the money supply or money production or system, and Abraham Lincoln. So this apparently was the basis of the American Revolution, to decouple from, from the European bankers, and especially from England, so that the colonies would have sovereignty over their own money creation. So Ben Franklin had this figured out. Um, uh, Jefferson had it figured out. So some say that was the whole basis of the Revolutionary War. So Abraham Lincoln, when he came to power, 
during with the Civil War was getting challenged. He was trying to they were trying to blackmail him and try to get debt financing, 60 percent terms for money, you know, for debt money to pay for either side of the Civil War. Uh, and Lincoln said, no, we're going to create our own money. Uh, and we call it they call it the greenback. So they, they created their own money to pay for, you know, the North to win the war and, or the Civil War. And apparently that model then was studied by Sun Yat-sen who overthrew the Qing dynasty, the last dynasty in China, and then brought into power, into force Lincoln's ideas on the creation of money. And what does that mean? It means that China, in my reading, has the only true sovereign money system in the world, uh, which means they create, like I've just said, money for the national interests and needs. Um, now one could one could quibble about whether that's working well, or we could, you know, of course we can debate whether we like the communists or not. Um, I'm not a big fan of communism, but it's, the, but the the fact that they would have taken this model and Mao kept the model, right, even though he overthrew the, the nationalists, means that China seems to have a system in which I've just argued a form of money as public utility. So create as much as we need for the people of, of China to get them you know, out of poverty, you know, to build up our economy rapidly. Um, and, and eventually, I think, over outperform the Western debt money systems. Mm. Now, it, it, can, it could completely go the other way if, if uh, the banks, the private banks get more control of the money system in China as they have in other, in other nations. So okay. it could go sideways. Or it could go in a completely different or, or the direction I'm proposing, which is a well-being economy. Um, we'll see. Yeah, for sure. Well, hold, hold space for that. And uh, what do you think um, the role gold has to play? Because I know China, you know, currently and even traditionally, there are large, large purchases of gold, as is Russia and, and India and many other countries. And if I'm not mistaken, that was one of the kind of uh, advantages that the U.S. had in holding the world's reserve currency at that time it was at Bretton Woods. You know, after the war, they had the largest uh, gold reserves, and they had committed to uh, you know backing that. And and then subsequently, over the years, uh, that that backing was gone. And I think they've maintained their uh, position of world reserves cur currency primarily through force. Uh, a lot of wars overseas to continue to make sure it's being used. And, and today, I think that's still relevant, but it's also, well, where else do we go and, and what else do uh, we use? But it, it certainly is, is being challenged. Uh, do you think that might play a role too as well? That, could that even come back? Are we going to go to you know, using gold as a foundation uh, for currency? Well, gold, I mean, again, gold is an interesting um, form of money, and it was definitely you know, the US dollar was tied to gold and, you know, you, you could trade your dollar bill for so many grams of gold uh, until Nixon changed that in the early seventies. So that actually the tying it to gold was interesting because it, the, the total volume of gold ever mined uh, in any year was only about 2% by, by volume. So it meant that it actually created a sort of a, a limiter on economic growth. So once, if you remove the gold standard, your economy could expand as, fa as fast as the money supply expands. In other words, as fast as the debt without the limitations of gold. Uh, I mean, there are many reasons why the U.S. couldn't afford to uh, fulfill its promises on those grams of gold per dollar because uh, it just would have run out of supply, uh, probably. And even though it had, after the war, you know, apparently it had stored Britain's gold supply, right? And so, um, and for centuries, you know, those who had the gold, you know, tended to be the dominant powers. Uh, but now with debt money as the only form of, of you know, uh, of power, and then tied to oil, which it was since, since OPEC, um, you have the petrodollar, the dominance of the U.S. Uh, currency. And yes, it appears that, now we're seeing that uh, 
that uh, strength weakening, right? With global currency, you know, you have more diverse currencies and whether one will become more dominant again, like the US dollar, or will we have a sort of a basket of currencies? Who knows uh, how that'll evolve? But my, my challenge is gold is not, to me, the asset that money should be backed by. Not, it's not the only asset. I mean, we should have, in my, my opinion, we should have money tied to the assets of a nation. So how much soil do you have for growing food? How much fresh water do you have? How much, you know, even things like carbon and certainly the human capital of a nation, right? The people, those are all assets upon which money should be tied and linked, not just to some shiny metal, uh, which only has certain utility for certain things. So if you had a basket of assets like land and, and people and even things like trust and relationship with social capital, you might have a different monetary policy that emerges so that every nation has its own unique set of assets. It trades in its comparative advantage, not the trade model that it, you know Adam Smith articulated, but it's a model where you're trading in that comparative advantage of the nation. And that's usually natural capital-based advantages of the land. It, you know, and, um, that would make that would make the global trade model completely different. I mean, it would just be fundamentally different, uh, and we wouldn't be trading as much. Probably, we would just, you know, we try to optimize well-being at the national level, regional level, right? And yeah, we'd still want to buy coffee and things like that. So we'd still want imports. I mean, who doesn't like their coffee or their oranges or bananas or, you know? But it would it would just it would reduce the carbon footprint on the planet significantly. See, yeah. that, that's the point I'm making is like all this debt money causes overproduction, over trading, um, which destroys the ecosystem uh, unnecessarily because we're chasing something that we actually created out of our imagination anyways. Right. Yeah, it's true. So when you look at the, the problems that we have with this kind of insane financial system, like you say that, <laughs> you know, sends us down this path of, of overproduction. And here we are, right? I mean, I, I see what's happening right now, ultimately as, as a blessing, as, as difficult as it is to go through and, and, and hopefully truly as a catalyst to bring us to a greater place. And are, are you an optimist in that sense? Do you, do you kind of see that? Okay, there's a silver lining. This is a system that's kind of messed up and uh, we need to go, we need to create something new. Uh, you feel we're, we're gonna be able to do that? Uh, well, I'm, yeah, I'm an eternal optimist. I, I do think this was a great uh, pause for everybody. And I wasn't sure how, whether that and how that might happen, but here we are. It took a, a pandemic to bring us to, you know, our collective, you know, it's like this big pause, but we've been on pause for quite a while. The, the challenge I see is that, you know, one could, if you're playing chess here, um, and you understand that like who controls that system of money and uh, creation, and you were to democratize money now, if you imagine that, I'm not sure those in power are committed to that. Um, yeah. So there's that sort of, my more cynical side would say, you know, if you knew that in 70 years, you're gonna run at a runway, right? The, that the debt would become just untenable uh, that it would consume all of the oxygen of the economy uh, and you could just hit reset like a hard boot on the computer and wipe it all out and start again but so what it but what are you going to leave citizens with uh, a system of even more control more consolidation of power and in, in still fewer hands uh, you know uh, monocultures of retail etc right yeah. which we're seeing that that's the wrong way to go. We need to, I think, model our economies after ecosystems, which are diverse. Uh, they're resilient because of their diversity. Um, they're not monocultures and they're not hegemonic and they're not, you know, oligarchies. So can we model the, the next economy based on those principles we find in nature? I think that's the big challenge we face. And I'm not sure 
we have space for that conversation to be happening right now right. because we're, and we're looking maybe for a, a grand solution. Some call the grand reset. It's like, no, no, the re the reset. I mean, the reset could have happened 20 years ago. Uh, the reset almost happened in 2008, you know, when that system started to fall apart, but we saved it a little longer. Right. And, uh, it's gone so, a little bigger too. So that you know, we we know that we can build an atom bomb in a few months. We did that. Uh in Bretton Woods, we sat down, they sat down for three weeks and they hammered out a deal, right? That brought us to where we are today. So that's the question I'm asking is isn't this a, a global emergency in which we need to rethink the whole economic order? Uh and why not well being? Yeah, that's well. you know. Why not? It's not like we can't do it. Um, so the cynical side of me says, I'm not sure that those who had right control of the chessboard are going to simply not put the pieces back uh, to their starting positions again, um, as opposed to totally democratizing money. Yeah, no, I hear you. It's a it's a big ask, right? I mean, if you if you had control of just creating the money supply and you know everything that's happening right now, it is a big ask for them to to. That's right. That. Yeah. So. So but, yeah, op absolutely optimistic. I mean, maybe in the in the end, you know, nature will have its final uh, say. Uh, but uh, you know, humility is a hard thing. So. Yeah, for sure. And uh, I, I'm with you as well in terms of the more we can kind of, you know, mimic nature, the more that we can create diversity uh, and focus locally, right? This whole idea of like a big global plan and, and reset uh, doesn't appeal to me in terms of centralizing more power and uh, decision making that way. So what, what can, maybe we'll just kind of leave off on this is, uh, you know, what advice do you have for people? Obviously there's, there's some big unanswered questions that need to be kind of set forth by the powers that be, but of course, you know, the power is in the people's hands and, and what can we do individually? We talked about increasing our financial literacy, understanding how economic works, listening to your podcast, reading your books. Uh, so we can be a part of these conversations intelligently and help move our communities and our society forward. Uh, what other advice do you have for, for people that are listening? Well, as you said, Malcolm, it's, um, you know, for it's each, for each one of us to, you know, happiness is an individual choice, um, that path. And, and I'm not going to uh, suggest there's my path is, good for you. But I think, you know, the, the key thing that I've, you know, certainly experienced the joy of being out of debt and not having that constraint. So that's probably a little, that's tough for a lot of people right now, but um, you know, and, and to start to have these conversations more amongst um, your, you know, your family, um, hopefully elected officials or, or listening to some of these ideas uh, let's, uh, you know, let's sit down together respectfully and figure out, is there a different path? And, you know, I'm doing my thing as a macroeconomist, trying to get these ideas floated in at the political level and even the Bank of Canada. And um, so that's the role I'm playing. Um, and, and I think, I mean, the, the interesting thing, I think during COVID, the, uh, the local economies are actually doing okay. I think that especially in smaller communities, I just talked to someone in Creston, BC, and they said, you know, we're, we're okay. Like we're, you know, yeah, it's tough, but, you know, before COVID, we maybe relied on a lot of, you know, external money flows, but now we're kind of settled into more of a local economy groove, right? We're, you know, we're, we're still, we, we haven't shuttered our doors. Um, yes. And, and so it's an interesting challenge for us to, get to know our neighbors better to realize that, you know, this liquidity, this currency circulation stuff, if we can keep it going locally, um, you know, we'll, all, we'll, we'll get by, we won't maybe have the same expenditure or, or household incomes as we had before, mm -hmm. but uh, maybe that's the silver lining in this that we, uh, and, and again, through those conversations, like every dollar you spend is kind of like a vote for, you know, where your values are, you know, if you want to buy bread from your local baker, then try to support your local baker so they don't go out of business and local baker buys farm from farmer Joe, who maybe grows 
red five wheat and you know just all these relationships are and that's what's very indigenous about indigenous people like it's all about the relationships um and so if you think about money as a relational you know value chain if you like right supply chain then it's kind of cool because you know it all ties then back to the earth back to the land um and and that may mean that alberta's economy throttles down a lot more than it is uh even now so the gdp is lower the spending rates are lower right but are we still okay are we eating all right are we healthy um that should be our first you know our neighbors okay or they're not depressed and you know all those things so and that's the stuff you talk about so I think that's the, yeah, it's not going to be easy. It's a transition. Hey, we, how long have we been at this now? Since, uh, since March, right? So it feels yeah. like a lifetime, For but sure. uh, we're kind of, uh, kind of resilient. That's the great thing about human beings. We're resilient and, and we're creative and, and we're all burdens. Like we're entrepreneurs. We're, you know, we will get through it. Yeah, totally. And yeah. we have to laugh. We, we, we need a lot of laughter too. <laughs> for sure laughter right. is medicine yeah absolutely and uh, I, love, I love your vision of that kind of relocalization uh and really just you know that perspective on on what is wealth right what what is an asset what do we value and really you know putting our dollar where our mouth is in that sense and and not only in those kind of you know uh financial transactions uh, which are huge and, and will shape uh, our lives and our economies, but also those relationships that is absolutely huge as well. That's right. So, yeah. Yeah. So there it is. There it is. Okay. Malcolm right for on. premier. Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> oh gosh. That, that's that's what we like. We like to end our podcast, you know, Malcolm for president. No, forget that one. About, <laughs> Malcolm, <laughs> Malcolm for mayor. Well, I want, for sure. <laughs> yeah. Cool. All right. Well, definitely, uh, folks, give give Mark a follow. Um, you know, again, I, I, I love what you said, too. It's like each of us has, and, and I'm paraphrasing, each of us has a role to play and gifts to offer. And Mark is certainly doing uh, his role. So the more that we can support him and just even by buying his book and, you know, sharing out his name and listening to his podcasts, we can educate ourselves and we can elevate someone like Mark who, uh, who has influence at a kind of a broader uh, scale as well. So let folks know how they can find you uh connect with you a little bit more so we mentioned the podcast are you on facebook instagram these types of social media platforms as well i'm on some of those platforms i i prefer linkedin as my platform i i'm not a big fan of facebook but um you know i i use linkedin a, as a platform because i assume that people who read those articles that i post are you know they're prof they're professional or whatever they're they're not gonna, you know, it's not about name calling or, so, you know, so I, I enjoy that platform. I've got my own website in Yelsky.com, but it's, you know, like most of our personal website, you don't get that much traffic. Yeah. <laughs> I get way more traffic on, on LinkedIn and the podcasts or people like podcasts apparently. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. But it's, it's been fun to do the podcast because it, everyone's got a great, you know, everyone has a story and, uh, I think the stories I've captured a lot during COVID have been uh, really, uh, you know, affected some people in a positive way. And they're just ideas, right? They're just throw stuff out there and people have great ideas. And so it's great. I love, I love the podcast platform. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. All right. Well, you're doing a great job and appreciate you sharing some of your afternoon with us, sharing some of your ideas. Thanks, Malcolm. Okay. Thanks a lot, Mark. Okay. Yeah. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.